In 2013, Polish economist Dr. Krzysztof Rubinski wrote a short story on economic issues titled The Lawn. He compared two housing estates in different cities. In the first one, after building some blocks of flats, the ground was leveled, people were allowed to trample out paths, and it was only in these trodden places that the pavement was laid, and the rest of the area was planted with grass. In the second housing estate, the decision regarding where the pavement was to be located and where the grass was to be planted was made by bureaucrats. As this arrangement of pavements did not suit the residents, they started taking shortcuts and trampling the lawn. Officials reacted by placing a sign on it stating, please do not walk on grass, but it did not help. Bureaucrats decided to start an educational program in schools to teach people to respect green areas. Despite this, people still trampled the grass. Officials then employed three guards in three shifts and tightened sanctions for trampling the lawns. After some time, it turned out that even the guards themselves took shortcuts. So when competent guards were dismissed, costly monitoring systems were installed, and the officials introduced an IT system that automatically sent fines to irreverent residents. Residents undermined issuing such fines on legal grounds and began to take shortcuts again, trampling the grass once more. Then, officials called in the big guns. They began to prohibit the use of words such as shortcut and phrases such as go diagonally by calling these terms hate speech so as to change the human mentality of trampling the lawns and create a new man caring for green areas. However, people turned out to be resistant to such methods. After an unsuccessful attempt to solve the problem with the help of a world-famous consultant who described his solution in a 600-page report that no one understood, the head of the estate council finally came up with a brilliant solution to the problem. The next day, construction of a three-meter concrete wall along the pavement began. Of course, the story presented by Dr. Rybinski is fictional and exaggerated, but it touches on a real issue and an important one, unintended consequences of bureaucratic decisions. Examples of such unintended consequences are numerous, and we will show you some of them. One of the best-known examples is the so-called Cobra Effect, described by economist Horst Siebert. During British rule in India, there was a problem with a large amount of venomous cobras in Delhi that threatened the people. To solve this problem, a reward was set for each dead cobra. At first, it seemed that this solution was effective, but as it turned out, people began to breed cobras in order to get the money. When this practice came to light, the decision to pay rewards for cobras was withdrawn. As a consequence, cobra breeders lost any incentives to keep the snakes and release them into the streets. The final result was an increase in the number of venomous snakes, which made the problem that the initial regulation was supposed to solve even bigger. A similar but better documented example is the Great Rat Hunt in Hanoi, in Vietnam during the French rule at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. The French built a sewage system in Hanoi, which apart from the obvious advantages, was an ideal place for rats to breed. The rat population grew and became a problem, especially because some of the rodents were spreading diseases. Therefore, Vietnamese rat catchers were employed and being paid depending on the number of rats proven to be killed. The results came quickly. On record days, exterminators killed over 20,000 rats. Despite the intense fight with rats, which lasted over two years, their population was impossible to reduce. Another attempt was made to solve the problem. Apart from employing professional rat catchers, anyone could earn some extra because the authorities established a prize for every rat tail brought to them. The Vietnamese began to bring thousands of rat tails, and, at first, it seemed to be a great success. Soon, however, rats without tails were seen running all around the city. As it turned out, people caught live rats, cut off their tails, and let them breed, which produced even more valuable tails. Meanwhile, in the suburbs of Hanoi, breeding rats for their tails flourished as an enterprise. The deratization program increased the number of rats by creating an indirect incentive to breed them. When the truth came to light, the decision to issue the prize was withdrawn, and the rat fight program turned out to be a big flop. The problem with rats in Hanoi continues to this day. Rent control is another good example of unintended consequences. 
Let's assume that in a certain city, market prices of rental apartments were $600, but as a result of the increase in the city's population and of inflation, they have risen to $900. Tenants are, of course, dissatisfied with such increases. Politicians introduce rent control, i.e. keeping rental prices below market level. However, this has consequences. Higher prices favor better housing allocation. People living alone were encouraged to move to smaller apartments, thus freeing up space for families with children. Higher prices also encourage the construction of new rental apartments in response to increased demand. Increased supply would put downward pressure on prices. Rent control eliminates these incentives. People stop saving housing space. Incentives for new housing are also disappearing. Like any maximum price set below market price, rent control causes an artificial shortage. If the price is fixed, there are more people who want to rent an apartment than there are apartments available for rent on the market. Householders can put estates into different usage, e.g., turn them into office spaces or holiday apartments, which are not subject to price control, and it will make the shortage of rental apartments even more severe. However, if householders decide to continue renting, they can, without risk of losing further profits, discriminate against potential tenants based on race, gender, having children, having pets, or for any other reason. In a word, they can choose from a huge amount of people who want to rent an apartment. For example, they can choose people who accept lower housing standards. Since we're on the subject of standards, they will go down. Householders will not have incentives to fix damages in the apartment or to do periodic renovations, etc. There are many willing to rent apartments waiting in line, so there will always be someone who accepts worse standards. When prices are set well below the market price, this may discourage householders from carrying out even the most necessary repairs. At times, price control not only eliminated the householders' profits, but brought them losses, and in this situation, no owner would pay extra to the business. When it happens, Householders are forced to incur losses. They have a huge problem with any attempt to sell apartments or buildings. They even have trouble giving them away for free. Henry Hazlitt, in Economics in One Lesson, more specifically in the second edition, described the rent control imposed on cheaper apartments as follows. Where the population is increasing, the deterioration and shortage in low-income housing will grow worse and worse. It may reach a point where many landlords not only cease to make any profit, but are faced with mounting and compulsory losses. They may find that they cannot even give their property away. They may actually abandon their property and disappear, so they cannot be held liable for taxes. When owners cease supplying heat and other basic services, the tenants are compelled to abandon their apartments. Wider and wider neighborhoods are reduced to slums. In recent years, in New York City, it has become a common sight to see whole blocks of abandoned apartments with windows broken or boarded up to prevent further havoc by vandals. A further effect is the erosion of city revenues as the tax base continues to shrink. When these consequences are so clear that they become glaring, there is of course no acknowledgement on the part of the imposers of rent control that they have blundered. Instead, they denounce the capitalist system. They contend that the private enterprise has failed again that private enterprise cannot do the job. Therefore, they argue, the state must step in and itself build low-rent housing. Some even say the best way to destroy a city, apart from bombing it, is rent control. In fact, this is not a great exaggeration. As you can see in the displayed pictures, these are the consequences of long-term rent control. The authorities, faced with the unforeseen consequences of their own policy, have three options to choose from. Accept the negative effects of their policy and not take any new action. Abolish regulations that had negative effects. Try to fix the negative effects with subsequent regulations and market interventions. Of course, it is not certain which one of these options the authority will choose. All of these three case scenarios do happen. Sometimes the authority withdraws harmful regulations, as in the case of rat hunting described earlier or they maintain regulations by accepting or disregarding the negative effects, as in the case of rent inspections in New York. It also happens, however, 
The authority tries to fix negative effects of regulations with subsequent regulations. A good example of the last option is the healthcare system in the United States. Officials did not withdraw their own decisions or the ones made by their predecessors even when their negative effects came to light. Instead, they introduced further regulations to solve problems. We described this process in our movie, Why is U.S. Healthcare System So Expensive? Historians Hancock and Gowing described in their book, British War Economy, an example of government intervention that the authorities considered necessary for effective warfare. Let's hear about it. There was, for example, a quite unprecedented need for sacks. Armies had always used large quantities of sacks. The supply services wanted them for packing and transporting stores and as nosebags for their horses. The infantry wanted them for the construction of earthworks and trenches. Towards the end of 1914, the infantry were beginning to dig as infantry had never dug before. They kept on digging throughout the war. By November 1918, the number of sandbags supplied by British makes to the British and Allied armies, chiefly for the construction of trenches and dugouts, had reached the dizzy total of 1,186 millions. A demand so fantastic had never been dreamt of at the beginning of the war. Towards the close of 1914, the army was calling for bags at the rate of about a quarter of a million a month. By May 1915, it was demanding 6 million a month, and even this figure fell short of the growing need. When the war office went into the market to buy sacks, it met with an unsatisfactory response. It sent officials to Liverpool to requisition the stocks of the sack merchants there. It sent other officials to Dundee to get a lien on the production of the jute manufacturers. The business of the Liverpool merchants was soon settled. They were paid at a figure representing the market price of sacks before the demand of the army had sent the prices rocketing. But the Dundee manufacturers had problems that required more patient and intricate handling. To begin with, they were choked up with private contracts at home and in the export trade. These contracts, the war office required them to break so that they might be free to concentrate their whole effort of production, at least for the time being, upon satisfying the requirements of the army. At what price? After dealing so summarily with the claims of the merchants and private consumers, it would have been absurd for the government to allow the manufacturers supply and demand prices in a market that had been so completely transformed by its own abnormal demand. On the other hand, there were reasons of expediency, as well as of justice, prompting it to allow manufacturers recovery of their cost and a reasonable margin of profit. Otherwise, it might find that it had aggravated the problem of supply by destroying the incentive to production. Along these lines, the war office officials opened negotiations with the jute manufacturers. Very soon, they discovered that it would be futile to fix a price for the end production only. Some units of industry were large enough to cover all of its processes, but others confined themselves to a single process, such as sewing or weaving or spinning. It was therefore necessary to fix a price covering cost and a fair profit margin at every stage of production, from the spinning of the raw jute to the dispatch of the finished bags to the army depots. Even this was not enough. Supply was not safeguarded, nor the elaborate pyramid of prices and controls firmly based until the British and Indian governments took inserted measures to fix prices for and to ensure regular deliveries of the raw material itself. Economically, the vertical penetration of control downwards towards the sources of raw material supply repeated itself in all controlled industries, with differences in its speed of penetration and ultimate comprehensiveness. In general, it may be said the centralization of purchase was pushed furthest when supplies were scarcest, these events took place during World War I. Such activities of the British government were not previously planned. When it turned out that the intervention would have inevitable negative effects, the government started to intervene even more to remedy the situation. Meanwhile, however, the government controlled increasingly larger areas of the market. The war ended before control became all-embracing, because everything was headed in that direction, towards total control. World War II proved this emphatically when the same pattern of actions was applied with even greater zeal. From the government's viewpoint, there were specific reasons why control could not be limited only to certain sectors and had to be extended to others. Ludwig von Mises explains this. 
If some branches were to be left free, out of regard for the fact that they produce only goods qualified as non-vital or even as luxuries, capital and labor would tend to flow into them and the result would be a drop in the supply of those goods, the prices of which government has fixed precisely because it considers them as indispensable for the satisfaction of the needs of the masses. But when this state of all-round control of business is attained, there can no longer be any question of a market economy. No longer do the citizens, by their buying and abstention from buying, determine what should be produced and how. The power to decide these matters has devolved upon the government. This is no longer capitalism. It is all-round planning by the government. It is socialism. For the scheme of social transformation which I have depicted is not merely a theoretical construction. It is a realistic portrayal of the succession of events that brought about socialism in Germany, in Great Britain, and in some other countries. After the end of World War II, Great Britain was in fact a national socialist economy, as defined in the Capitalism, Socialism, Interventionism video. Socialism was not introduced there through revolution, but through consistent regulation and control of subsequent areas of the economy. Again quoting Mises, It is noteworthy to remember that British socialism was not an achievement of Mr. Attlee's labor government, but of the war cabinet of Mr. Winston Churchill. What the Labour Party did was not the establishment of socialism in a free country, but retaining socialism as it had developed during the war and in the post-war period. The fact has been obscured by the great sensation made about the nationalization of the Bank of England, the coal mines, and other branches of business. However, Great Britain is to be called a socialist country not because certain enterprises have been formally expropriated and nationalized, but because all the economic activities of all citizens are subject to full control of the government and its agencies. Of course, it does not have to be that way. During the war, priorities change and effective defense against the aggressor becomes more important than economic efficiency. In a normal, peaceful situation, whenever a newly introduced regulation will have effects opposite to the expected ones, the government has three options described above. Withdraw the regulation, accept its negative effects, or repair the negative effects by subsequent interventions. The best way to not have this dilemma is to thoroughly and meticulously examine the economic impact of the proposed policy before implementing it. However, when there are already unintended negative consequences of a given policy, one should be very careful in any attempts to fix them with subsequent regulations and in consistently choosing the third way. Because the third way is the way towards socialism.